and I'll tell you the next step, it's it's a little difficult to hear, but the next step, because they need to keep building up the fear of these UAPs, next step is really for the UAPs to start um, shooting down our commercial airliners and our military jets uh, from the skies. Uh, and that, I believe, is going to be happening very, very soon. Welcome to Redacted Conversations. I'm Clayton Morris. On this show, we invite journalists and thought leaders and whistleblowers and interesting people who have interesting stories to tell. And our guest today is John D'Souza. John D'Souza is a retired FBI special agent who served 25 years on counterterrorism, paranormal cases. He had a top secret security clearance during his FBI career. In fact, D'Souza literally collected the real life X-Files that were used in the show, The X-Files. And I, I want to welcome John in. John, uh, you know, I became aware of you because I think about a year ago, you said publicly on an interview that I caught that, hey, the government is going to use some sort of a UFO invasion, a fake UFO invasion story. And you laid it out specifically. And then wouldn't you know... <laughs> few weeks ago, we have Chinese balloons and UFO invasion. And I remembered that interview. We featured it on the show. And my audience was like, holy smokes, he got it right. So, John, that's how I first learned about you. So I said, I want to have John on the show. I want to hear about his FBI career. I want to hear about these X-Files. I want to hear about your writing. I want to hear about how prescient you were with all of these, um, this awareness about what the deep state is doing, the cabal and all of that. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Clayton. It is great to be here with you on Redacted Conversations, Redacted News. You guys are fantastic, and I am so happy to be here. This is a great uh, privilege for me, and uh, yes, uh, all that you were saying is uh, correct. And uh, I, I am John D'Souza. I was a special agent investigator in the FBI for 25 years. Uh, that was, well, over 25 years, and I was... Uh, mm -hmm the uh, agent that had several of their stories uh, way back in uh, 1993. Uh, there were several of my stories were taken uh, by, uh, by a show that was going on the air at that time uh, for about a year. Uh, it was called The X-Files and it was uh, using several of my cases uh, and um, the FBI actually called the creator of that show uh, while I was there, the uh, our bosses at the FBI, and told him, uh, where did you get those stories from? Uh, <laughs> because they were classified. They were not only classified, they were buttoned up, what we call buttoned up, having everybody sign additional non-disclosures and things like that. And so um, the creator, Chris Carter, he tells this story today. Uh, he had to uh, answer. He was told by the FBI that his thing was, his show was going to be shut down. And uh, he had to tell them uh, where they got his show because they were obviously accusing me at the time of giving this information to uh, Chris Carter. That was not the case. And uh, he expressed to them that uh, that was not the case as well. And um, he actually got the stories from several uh, retired FBI agents that actually were working with me and went to Hollywood to be consultants. Hmm. And they got my, what we call the OTB book, the off the books notes that I have of cases that uh, can that were not really put into FBI files for various reasons. Uh, many of us have those books and uh, they're very uh, interesting and they're very good. And uh, other than that though, I also worked all the big counterterrorism cases as well. That was kind of like my, my major while paranormal was kind of my minor at that point. And uh, so that's where I come from. That's what I have done. And uh, I have a, a lot of a lot of things that I share with people these days 
uh, in my books and in my presentations and everything else that I do around the world. So I want to dive into a lot of these things. I want to talk about the cabal today. I want to talk about the deep state. I want to talk about why you left the FBI, or maybe the current state of the FBI. Um, but first, before we get into some of that, maybe we can just talk about some of the news of the day, which how I came to learn about you, which is around this UFO flap, this Chinese balloon story. And you, over a year ago, were saying... They are lying to us what they're going to do next. It's already prepared. They are going to tell us that a UFO invasion is coming. It will be used as a story. There won't be a UFO invasion. It'll be used as a story. And then I couldn't believe this all. I mean, it was all laid out there. It all was coming to be. Oh, it was Chinese balloons. Now maybe it was UFOs. Now it's UFOs. And now we're really ramping up the Pentagon awareness about it. And I, you know, my my side of it has been that they want to use this story to spend money, the military industrial complex to continue to make billions of dollars and using space force as the next way to do that and all of this. So am I wrong about that or could you elaborate on that? And how did you know that this was going to be the case, that they were going to use this story um, to scare people? The way that I knew was through my investigations that have been painstaking over the years. And uh, also my information that I get from the intelligence community. Uh, in, the, in the intelligence community, uh, which is the people who have worked with and been around uh, the FBI, the, the NSA, the CIA, the, all this, and also the um, intelligence agencies of other nations, of the other English speaking nations, uh, which includes many countries. Um, because we, we also count um, India, Israel in that as well, and many others. Um, uh, and so we have a way of sharing information to each other, which is through <laughs> something called raw data and rumor, so that we are not violating any secrecy, we're not violating any top secret uh, sort of uh, prohibitions. So we're able to talk to each other about rumors, uh, about things that may possibly be true. And the thing is today, when you're in an atmosphere of complete and total deception, like we are today, uh, then um, rumors become possibly life-saving, potentially life-saving at this point. Right. And that's where we are. That's where we are today again, so that we are actually able to latch on to important rumors, uh, raw data, that is running around and we're able to share it. And that's a large part of how um, I get my information and how I get the things that I have. Um, for, for instance, um, it was actually several years ago uh, when I actually uh, wrote, wrote my book, The Extra Dimensionals, my book, The Extra Dimensionals, which lays out everything that we've been talking about. It lays out the fake alien invasion. Anybody who follows me, knows that I've been talking about this for several years, for several years now. And because it's, and it's all playing out exactly as, as I ascertained in my book, The Extra Dimensionals, which by the way, has just gone back to number one bestseller on all the Amazon lists oh, great. in this country because of that, because, and I've had all kinds of mainstream media trying to contact me. It's blown up like crazily. Uh, trying to contact me because my predictions from the extra dimensionals is are coming true right now and the main part of that uh of that prediction is that we would have this um uh, you hear this buzzword uh uaps uap right rather rather than ufo um we had this elaborate operation uh, it's a it's a psychological operation, the psyop, that has gone forward uh, since I would say about 2012, but it actually goes back to 2004, uh, because the New York Times, the great launch pad of all giant psyops, uh, the New York Times actually in 2012 I believe uh, revealed, or maybe may have been later than that revealed this UAP operation where where the 
the Navy has basically, the U.S. Navy, sorry, United States Navy has actually tr taken over, taken over the UFO, the entire UFO uh, uh, genre from the Air Force. Because all of these, all of these things, UFOs, uh, UAPs, should belong to the United States Air Force, like they always have since since Roswell, since Roswell uh, in the nineteen fifties, I believe. Um, and they've the U.S. the U.S. Air Force has always belonged to this, has always taken over this area. Uh, now it's been shifted because they decided to move into this UAP phenomena, where in two thousand four. We had a uh, we had a bunch of these uh, sort of silver colored, um, and what they are is they're they're top secret drones. They're they're drones that possibly use anti gravity technology from possibly Roswell. That was technology transferred from Roswell, and so we have all of these UAPs. And in two thousand four, we had a final giant experiment. Uh, off the coast of California in the Pacific Ocean, where we had the uh, no less no less a power military force than the U.S. Nimitz uh, Carrier Group Battle Carrier Group that was off the coast of California and gave a and created a, a safe space for this final experimentation that went on. That's my uh, description of what happened. In the uh, in the uh, New York Times and other in all media around the world, it was described as, well, the Nimitz Carrier Group just suddenly happened upon these uh, UFOs, and mm. uh, they they kind of you know use softer language to describe UFOs, but they said, oh, this group of UFOs were buzzing around and they were at incredible speeds, and and here's the pilots' conversations that uh, they had at the time to tell us about this. It's incredible. It's amazing. Uh, and uh, then we had the launch. That was the launching of the UAP phenomena across this country. Hmm. Ahead, so it starts there, absolutely. right? When the New York Times breaks that story, right? And everything. Oh my God! Now we can talk about this, right? In the mainstream, right. and the Pentagon can start exactly. holding. We're going to have committees on this. Congress is looking into yes. this. Senator Marco Rubio yes. wants to make more money off of this. The whole thing starts and, yes. and moves exactly. in that direction, right? And it's a psychological exactly. operation. So it was all yeah. controlled, was what you're saying. This idea that this, yes. that we we knew that USS Nimitz was going to be there, and this was all sort of planned for this to be launched and sort of disseminated to the public. So right. these drones, exactly. these these craft, are they U.S. made craft, reverse engineered from downed Roswell craft, or are these otherworldly yeah. beings, otherworldly craft. What does your intelligence tell you about that? If you were in, involved in the X-Files program and, <laughs> yeah. you know, at the FBI, well, what do you know about it? Well, you had about three questions there and I would say yes, no, and yes, but uh, <laughs> okay, the, go for the, answers, <laughs> the answers are that uh, no, they are, they are man-made. They are man-made uh, things. Uh, they are they are recognizable by the signature silverish sort of skin that they have. It's this, uh, but the shapes tend to be different in every case. There are some that are cigar shaped. Uh, there are some that are larger. There are some that are much, much smaller. Uh, so many, some of them are those tic tac shapes, those kind of ovals. Uh, so they're all different uh, shapes and sizes. However, they have the. Um, they have the same uh, signatures uh, of the uh, movement that they are able to capable of. However, the way that we know they are not true UFOs, true UFOs can be extraterrestrial and extra dimensional. In other words, they can, they are usually, uh, they have capacity for shape shifting. They have a capacity for disappearing and reappearing. They have that is one of the ways that we know genuine UFOs are afoot. Uh, we're able to see those qualities in them. These tic uh, these tic tacs, these UAPs don't have those don't have those abilities. However, I, I do believe that they are very they have the ability to uh, destroy things, to destroy things, and that's why they're being uh, built up. They are not. They are not, and this is the, the thing we're struggling with even now uh, in our Congress, in our Senate, uh, and in other places. Uh, 
the uh, they are not they are man made, but they appear not to be made by the United States per se. Uh, we do have a congressman recently. Um, I, I I don't want to get summoned before any subcommittees, so I won't say his name. But we have congressman uh, from I think he was from Indiana who ran around. Uh, he was running around to these different subcommittees. And one of the things that he said was, these things uh, are appear to be man-made. And this is after several classified briefings that the subcommittees think nobody finds anything out about. Uh, he said, it appears that these, uh, that these vehicles are man-made. Indeed, they are. But they're not made by the United States. They appear not to be made by Russia or China. However, we, uh, it does appear that our global uh, aerospace companies probably had uh, several hands in creating these things. And he's talking mm. about McDonnell Douglas, Raytheon, and several other companies that really don't consider themselves American. Uh, they're, actually, they're actually global global companies. And he said, it looks like those guys had had some kind of hand in creating these UAPs, but it appears they are not under the control of the United States or any other nation. And, and that's, that's all he said. And it was amazing uh, when he said that, uh, because it really leads to several other conclusions that, well, then who's controlling them? Uh, and it appears it appears that uh, the ones who are controlling them are the deep state, the which is not an American uh, organization, the deep state, the uh, the uh, cabal, uh, the Illuminati, the power that is over the nations appears to be controlling them, and that fits in perfectly with uh, them eventually building up this campaign of fear uh, in the nations, uh, which is what they're doing right now. Uh, to make people fear these UAPs, uh, uh, ultimately towards, and I'll tell you the next step, it's it's a little difficult to hear, but the next step, because they need to keep building up the fear of these UAPs, next step is really for the UAPs to start um, shooting down our commercial airliners and our military jets uh, from the skies. Uh, and that, I believe, is going to be happening very, very soon. So the fear, you know, at first we're hearing these Chinese balloons, we're hearing these stories about these things, and and for decades we've heard that these things are benevolent, that if anything they want peace. If they're over, if they're over um, Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana, that they don't want us using nuclear weapons, etc. Right? Anyone that follows these stories and knows the eyewitness accounts of the members of the military at Maelstrom Air Force Base, they were there and they were shutting off nuclear warheads that were not even connected right. to one another, right? With redundant right. systems. They were separately right. plugged in, basically, right? It's not like pulling out a surge protector. They were separately yeah. turned offline while this UFO was hovering above Maelstrom Air Force Base. And this is confirmed by members of the Air Force. Like, right. this is not me saying this. This is the Air Force exactly. saying this. So exactly. we've heard for decades that these are benevolent, that there's not, and now we're going to start to hear, they're going to start to use this story with these man-made craft, whether by Raytheon, whatever, to start, start creating problems, you know, so that we think that these are some otherworldly beings, but they're really us doing it. Mm -hmm. And they're going to start shooting down aircraft now. That's crazy. And I, I've heard similar things, so I'm not... What you're saying comports with what I'm hearing separately. And yes. it's scary, but I want to know what's the end goal, right? When I sit here and I, I, I sit back with my cup of coffee and I think, okay, three-dimensional chess, the deep state, the cabal, what they want, the World Economic Forum. They want control. They want a control of our money supply. They don't want any sovereign states. We know that. They want a global environment that they control. Unelected leaders what do they want in this situation where they would want to start taking down aircraft? What do you know from your experience in the FBI that they at this deep state, what do they want? The end goal is, and this is a long-term psychological operation. 
uh, as, as well as physical operation as well. Uh, the long-term goal is ultimately to put together this grand operation called fake alien invasion. Now, the only the only fake part about it is going to be that the alien visitors are involved with this. It's they're not. They're not at all. Uh, everything else is going to be real. The destruction that they bring to our cities is going to be real. Uh, that's that's what they want to do, uh, and that's the reason that they had to divorce uh, because of what you just said. Uh, a lot of um, and all of this, I I explain all of this in my book, The Extra Dimensionals, which came out several years ago, and all of the uh, the history of UFOs. Much of it has been benevolent towards towards mankind. Uh, for instance, we've seen since since Rendlesham, since Rendlesham in 1980, when when Reagan was in office, uh, we saw these uh, these uh, vehicle, these uh, UFOs that had all the all the hallmarks of actual UFOs, extra dimensional UFOs. They were they were UFOs that descended on a military, an American military base on British soil in Rendlesham Forest. And we saw them, a lot of them were filled with light. They were, they were obviously in a transitional state of matter. They had the ability to appear and disappear. Uh, and, um, and they all, now we're finding out, they all went and shut down nuclear missiles that were apparently at Rendlesham. Uh, and that has been something that we've seen throughout history. And the, one of the reasons that they do that is because they know that there's something is going to happen with those nuclear missiles at that moment that nobody else knows. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that they come and they deactivate these, uh, these nuclear missiles that are being readied for use in some capacity at that time. And there's been a long history of that uh, throughout, um, even before 1980 and even beyond. Uh, at that time. So this has been going on and that shows uh, benevolence, uh, benevolent intent from real, actual UFOs that are possibly extraterrestrial. That is the reason why this operation had to divorce themselves from the label UFOs and they had to create this new thing, mm. uh, UAPs. And the ultimate goal, again, as I said, is fake alien invasion, which will not be pretty holograms, as many people believe. Many people have taken my theories and my work, and they've kind of screwed up the punchline. Uh, and the reason is because they, they're they saying, oh, well, fake alien invasion is going to be just a bunch of holograms from Blue Beam Project, from the, from the Blue Beam operation. Right. Uh, and no, that's not what it's going to be. It's going to be these very physical, uh, and, and this is another thing. If you, if anyone follows my work um, or reads my books, they know that alien visitors and UFOs are not physical in the way that we are. They are just not physical, and that's something I first learned from the FBI uh, in a in a document that was handed to me as soon as I got into the FBI as a con as what we call a control file, and it was the uh, the uh, the uh, bullet the uh, magic bullet. Um, oh no, the, uh, which is a document. The uh, magic bullet is a document that I show in my, in my book, The Extra Dimensionals. It's a government document showing an FBI agent who had an informant. And he, he says in there that the uh, FBI, that the informant was an alien visitor. And he says that the alien gave him about eight conclusions about, and this was at the time of Roswell, when everyone was going nuts was going nuts and uh, trying to uh, ascertain what are all these UFOs. Apparently there was a huge worldwide uh, wave of UFOs across the planet at this time. Uh, so this FBI agent happened to be a scientist himself and he actually sent out this uh, document to the world, uh, to the world. And it said basically uh, alien, he gave eight conclusions. Alien visitors and UFOs are not physical. They are not physical. They are from another dimension. Mm -hmm. They are from another dimension of reality, and they can kind of manifest physically here for short periods of time. And the same is true of the UFOs that come with them. 
Um, and you also said they are here for peaceful purposes. We shouldn't attack them ever. If we do, it will go very, very badly for us. Hmm. And we saw we saw exactly that happen in 1952 over Washington, over Washington DC, when a bunch of UFOs came in over the most protected airspace uh, in the world, and our entire air force was sent out after them for the last time. It's the last time any any Western nation did that, and uh, uh, until now, uh, and so. And the reason it was the last time is because those uh, over 14 days, we saw in the uh, in the report that came out after that uh, in 1952, we saw that uh, those UFOs just embarrassed all of our military jets and did circles around them, uh, did over-unders, and for 14 days, they just humiliated our Air Force and could very easily have destroyed them, hmm. they very easily, and right. they didn't, they didn't. They just hung around for 14 days for some reason, I don't know why, uh, and they buzzed all over the Capitol and everywhere. And those appeared to be genuine UFOs at that time. Uh, but um, because they had that those abilities, those abilities to be filled with light, uh, to be a shape a shifting trend properties and so forth. And so these are the things that we need to look at so that we can tell when the government is lying to us, when they say things like, uh, yeah, we just we just shot down a bunch of UFOs. Uh, we just shot down. We're not going to show you any of the materials. Uh, right. We're not going to show you anything or tell you anything about it. But yeah, just trust us that we shot down. Real, U real UFOs cannot be shot down. We saw that in the Battle of Los Angeles when the entire California coast was militarized. Uh, against Japanese zeros, and uh, we had all these munitions out there, and then a couple of very large UFOs came sailing in, and they they shot everything they had up at it. All they did was kill about four or five civilians on the ground. The munition, most of the munitions, uh, just passed gently through the UFOs, and then the, we had cameras that were taking pictures every second, every uh, half second there, and. Uh, after all the smoke cleared, you saw two giant UFOs very happily sailing away, undamaged, undamaged from this occurrence. Those were genuine UFOs because they had that ability to dematerialize, to uh, to have these ex these uh, mm. these qualities that only genuine UFOs can have. UAPs don't have that. So your time at the FBI. You were there for 25 years. You were involved in some of these cases. How did you start to get involved in some of these paranormal cases at the FBI? Oh, that's uh, because originally I, I was in the FBI from 1988 until 2013. That, that adds up 25 years. Wow. And uh, when I originally went in, when I originally went in, I actually went through, uh, went through the academy and one of the things that happened at the academy was that I um, ran into a couple of I ran into a couple of people that had worked this case, uh, this case in the FBI that was very, very, very famous, uh, especially uh, back in uh, back in the eighties. Uh, it was the case of Maddox and Platt. Uh, they were a couple of well, they appeared to be just a couple of hillbillies who had been running around uh, robbing banks robbing banks uh, throughout Miami, throughout Miami and Florida. And uh, it, it, they appeared to be normal people. However, what we found out later uh, was that they were very, very special in some sense because the uh, FBI, uh, an entire FBI uh, task force cornered them, cornered them and uh, was had a huge shootout with them because of course they wouldn't surrender. And they had a, a giant shootout with them, uh, and they had to drop on them. So uh, the the entire task force, both FBI agents and police officers, they had them. They shot them to pieces, uh, both of them. However, um, instead of falling down and dying, uh, they actually uh, got their weapons and decided to trudge through this. Uh, through this um, uh, parking lot. It was like a parking lot of one of the banks. Uh, it was a, well, actually it was a parking lot that they found at random and they they forced them into there because uh, they were in a bunch of cars. 
And um, then Maddox and Plot just got their weapons and started marching through the parking lot in a semicircle and killing the FBI agents and shooting the police officers. Uh, at that point, they um, they just they just did, and it was called the Miami Massacre. The Miami Massacre, also the Great Miami Shootout, was also called, and they shot all of them. They got all of them, and it was unbelievable what they did because one of them was even shot through the aorta at the time, uh, mm. and they were they should have been dead, and uh, they just marched through, and then they got in their car. And they were leaving. They were leaving after they shot all the FBI agents and all the uh, officers, and uh, they were leaving. Uh, then we had one uh, hero FBI agent who had had his entire his arm shattered by by Maddox and Platt, but he used his other hand, and he actually was able to shoot both of them, and he shot them, uh, shoot both of them through the car as they were leaving, and he was able to shoot them through the neck. Uh, and sever their spinal cords, and hmm. that's how they finally, they finally died. So anyway, when that after that happened, it was a huge scandal. It was a huge scandal. Like how were, how were these guys able to do what they did? This was unbelievable. This was, and so the FBI scientists uh, stepped forward and said, and said, oh no, they were probably loaded up on uh, angel dust. Uh, PCP was very popular at the time, so they said. Um, when people are loaded up on this uh, angel dust, they're able to perform superhuman uh, feats and they're able to blah, 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 so forth. Well, the uh, blood test came back and showed that they had nothing in their system except uh, except a couple of cigarettes that they had smoked uh, just before. They didn't even drink beer before they uh, were um, actually did this deed. And so it was a great it was a great mystery. And they were told to search for and they were told to search for hard drugs. Uh, in any anywhere that they could find it because you know people were looking for this explanation at the time and there was a lot of political pressure on this and the situation uh because to, to explain uh, a couple of dead and maimed uh, fbi agents several of them uh in this in this case and, and so those deputies were able to tell me that the only thing they found uh the only thing they found at this uh, at this place was they found a little altar that was a Norse, a pagan sort of Norse god altar. And it appeared that uh, these, these two individuals had, at that time, they did some kind of sacrifice to uh, to some uh, evil spirits uh, from Norse mythology. There was something to do with berserker spirits. And so, so I, I told them, I said, that's it. That's how they did what they did. They did some kind of sacrifice, and these, uh, these, uh, whatever it was the god of mischief that they did these uh, sacrifices to. Uh, I think it was called Loki, Loki, and uh, to the berserker spirits. And they were given these berserker spirits, whatever they are. Uh, they were given that in order to accomplish what they did, and that's that's what they did. They had a complete uh, dedication uh, on a spiritual level that inhabited them, came to them, and helped them to do these extraordinary feats that they did. Anyway, uh, at that point, uh, what happened was the uh, person in charge, the person in charge of the FBI Academy found out I was questioning people about this and found out that I was finding this out. He, uh, he then designated me as, uh, as possibly being a New York Times reporter or something of that sort. And so that very much upset them. Uh, he told me, uh, he tried to make sure that I didn't graduate the uh, FBI Academy. However, I did. I did because I knew everything he was going to do uh, against me. I was able to uh, graduate the FBI Academy. But then he uh, he gave me my credentials, much against his will. Uh, and he, uh, when I went to my first office, he said uh, he actually contacted them and told them, hey, this guy likes to do uh, paranormal cases, paranormal investigations. Let's uh, anything you've got, anything you hear of, let's load him up with that crap and uh, see how he enjoys that. Let's do that. And uh, my uh, first office said okay, and that's when they handed me uh, several of those uh, cases that I talked to you about earlier, and that's how I got started with paranormal wow. cases. <laughs> so from from 
from Norse, Norse berserker infused murderers, uh, bank robbers to, to UFO cases. Uh, were you then involved in UFO cases and, and in mysteries around UFOs, UAPs at that time at the FBI? Well, not UAP, UAPs, but yes, UFOs and that sort of thing. I became what we called a subject matter expert in those areas. Uh, what that means is that whenever we would, whenever in the FBI we would get a call from a desperate, let's say, sheriff or uh, a desperate uh, head of a jurisdiction anywhere in the country that had to do with UFOs, with paranormal, with abductions, with this sort of thing, uh, then um, they would uh, offer up that we did have a subject matter expert, well, the best that we could have at that time, uh, in this area, and uh, why would then um, go to assist in those areas under what's called a police cooperation request, uh, which is just it's just a one sheet of paper that's filled out by the uh, sheriff or the head of the jurisdiction, whoever they are, uh, just requesting FBI assistance in this area, uh, even if it doesn't fall under federal jurisdiction for whatever reason, technically. So that's that's how I got um, started with that sort of thing. So you would amount these 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 X files, these case files would be coming to you, and it would keep loading you up with these different. What was the? I don't know if you can talk about it, but what is maybe one of the craziest cases that you worked on that you still are scratching your head as to what you had to work on that we might not even know about or never heard about? Well, okay, the the craziest one that I'm, I'm still not supposed to talk about, but I can, I can say that uh, it, was, it was featured uh, in, I think it was about the first episode of The X-Files, or maybe it was the second of the first season. Um, by the way, they, they used my stories during the first season of The, F, of the X-Files, and then after that, they went to other, they, they no longer used my cases. Uh, however, uh, the rest of the X-Files uh, was was all based on true stories as well. Um, however, I would say the craziest uh, UFO, uh, the craziest paranormal case was when I was, I was sent to a military base. I mean, I can, I can say in general terms, I was sent to a military base. We, um, we observed, uh, a military base where they had had several disappearances that were that were associated with the appearance of UFOs in the in the area, and there were UFOs that the military base said the commander said I, I don't know what to do with this. I mean I'm I'm at my wit's end, and so we went to observe these UFOs that had been coming uh, that had been coming to this the outskirts of this military base. And on a regular basis, and they were filled with light. They were filled with light, almost like they didn't even appear metal anymore. And they would just come. Uh, they would come to the edge of this forest, and there were there was a group of people who would just do a regular observance of these things. And so myself and my partner, we went, and we were with those people. And for some reason, uh, one of the UFOs uh, picked us out for some reason, and came directly at us, came directly at us, and just, it appeared to land on us at some point. All the people ran, everyone ran, including us, uh, but it appeared to land on us, but then it didn't because it disappeared somehow. And uh, then uh, we, had, we had people from the base who took me in, who took me in uh, <laughs> against my will, they took me in and they uh, interrogated me uh, as to what my knowledge was of the UFOs. Why did the UFO come over to me in particular? Uh, maybe it was something about me that I summoned them or something. So anyway, I went through a long process of them questioning me over that. And Isn't it uh, amazing? Wait, you're, you're the FBI and they're questioning you? Yeah, that doesn't exactly. seem like that's how it usually how it usually works, right? Well, it's yeah, and it's because they were not military personnel. They were at the military. Uh, they were at the base, but they were all dressed in black. They were, you know, they appeared to be some I don't know, like special forces types of guys, 
and but they were all dressed in black. And then when they brought me into the military base to be interrogated, uh, they did not have any. Um, there were no military people around. I couldn't see any of them. Uh, so anyway, then we contacted our our FBI headquarters to get me released, and our FBI headquarters told me, "No, it's fine. They're those guys. We we know who they are. Uh, just answer their questions, and they're going to release you." And <laughs> so that's what we did. Uh, I answered as best I could, and then they ultimately uh, released me uh, uh, several hours later. And it was uh, just a horrendous, horrendous experience for me. And um, it was one that really told me that those guys were not uh, were not U.S. Uh, personnel. Let's put it that way. They were something higher, something higher, because the commander of the base lost total control. He had nothing mm -hmm. to do with this. Uh, and it told me that these guys were somehow connected to a higher power uh, with what we know today as the cabal, as the cabal. And um, that uh, they themselves don't fully know what is happening with the genuine UFOs. And they're desperate to find out. That's the what cabal, told me that night. The cabal is desperate to find out. Yes, yes, exactly. So what is, what is the cabal? For anyone watching right now, I, I say on our show, the deep state all the time. And I say, I refer to the deep state as the permanent government, the people that are there yes. after the four year presidents come and go, the senators come and go. These are the people that are unelected that actually run the show. Is the cabal the same thing or different? Uh, they are the same thing because that is a subsidiary of them, the deep state is basically the, um, well, we put, we say it this way, the deep state is the American subsidiary of the cabal. The cabal is an international, is a global international group of the, uh, of the bloodlines. Uh, we don't call them families, we call them bloodlines because they are, they have, throughout the ages, they have reproduced uh, preternaturally. Uh, they uh, reproduce and they go by different names. Uh, these bloodlines, uh, so they and they change their names every few generations, but they have existed since the beginning, since Babylonian Empire. They are the uh, group uh, that has controlled, let's say, uh, the Roman Empire by lending money to them, by giving mm -hmm. them money, and then giving money to the other sides as well. And mm. so they have been able to control both sides in every world conflict. And they have been able to manipulate, let's say, mm. they have been able to manipulate the, um, the uh, heads of the Roman Empire. Of the, uh, the last great success that they had was the, uh, was the Nazi Empire here uh, that almost took over the entire world. Uh, so that's what they that's what they use now. They use the uh, methods that they discovered during the Nazi uh, rise of power in 1938 in World War II. Um, so they are the uh, banking bloodlines, the banking uh, bloodlines that have existed for so long that basically tell the nations what to do. That's the cabal. That's who they are. And that's who they are today. Is, and is that the first time that you discovered them at that military base that day? Did, is that when you yes. said, oh, something else is going on here? And it's controlling here. Yes, absolutely. That was the first moment when I said, okay, U.S. nation authority means nothing here. Absolutely nothing. These guys control everything. And then, <laughs> and then the next moment when I realized that that was true was um, I was in the in the FBI, I was uh, one of the first FBI agents that worked that worked uh, something that we called at that time FISA investigations under the newly formed uh, FISA uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and FISC, the uh, Foreign uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court as well. It was the first the first law that got its own star chamber of judges of court of courts that were just dedicated to them. But now the reason the reason for that was because the FISA was only supposed to be used against international terrorists right. and agents, agents of a foreign power. 
agents of a foreign power, non-U.S. persons. That was the whole basis of the FISA. Well, what I found out later was that in, uh, oh, freak, I don't remember the year, it was uh, 19, early, early 1990s. The, uh, the New York Times decided to reveal the most top secret system uh, in the nation at the time, which was the FISC and the FISA system. And the New York Times just put out a bunch of, a bunch of articles revealing everything about FISA. You're not even, we are not even supposed to know the word FISA today. However, the New York Times took it upon themselves to reveal everything. It was all top secret too. It was all top secret. And they told everything about it. And at the time, Bush the elder, the, the first, the older Bush was president. And at that time he said, he said, we're going to prosecute everybody in the New York Times that revealed all this stuff about FISA. We got the evidence. We're going to put them all in prison. And wouldn't you know, uh, the New York Times said, no, he's not. And uh, sure enough, that was the next time that I found out that uh, the New York Times directly works with the cabal and has their authority, basically, because after all that, not a single person was ever questioned or called before a, a Senate committee uh, or anything for revealing for violations of the Espionage Act, which they committed, I mean, tremendously committed. Wow. And that was the other moment when I found out Wow, anybody that's associated with the cabal basically has higher authority than the president of the United States or anybody else. So that's uh, yeah, big, we see that with the New York Times, stuff. and we see that with the New York Times today is a mouthpiece of the deep state still to this day. We've seen that in the Ukraine war, uh, etc. So um, I'm curious why, and then when, what was it that decided you prompted you to, to to leave the FBI? What was the catalyst for that? after 25 years and and now you're after 25 you know, years yeah yeah after after that period of time what happened was uh the um i i was not going to leave the fbi however at that time we were suffering under the oppression of an individual named um renegade who had somehow who had somehow who was very well known as a as a hater of america uh, however, somehow the uh, cabal influenced American elections and got him to be president. It was the person, the individual that we know as Obama today, hmm. and he became uh, he became president of the United States, which is very ironic. And he actually uh, placed at that time the time uh, he placed in uh, over the FBI an individual named James Comey. Uh, right. He was, he was a person who was known in government to be nothing more than a water carrier for the Clinton Foundation. He had spent he had spent the the whole previous twenty years basically just running around and putting out fires, uh, minimizing investigations against the uh, the Clinton Foundation and making many of the investigations go away. Um, that's that's all he was known for, and that's all basically that he did. Uh, and then at that time. He was put in charge of the FBI. I tried to tell everyone I could that we cannot have this guy in charge of the FBI. Uh, eventually, uh, that word apparently got back to him, and he he actually uh, sent uh, what we call an angel of death over to uh, where I was in the FBI, and that person was trying was in charge of finding a way to get me fired and get me dismissed from the FBI before I retired, because I had already put in uh, for retirement uh, to get out uh, at that time. And uh, they tried, and all of this is documented in a, a, a movie called um, A Thousand Pieces, where I put all of this uh, so that the story is, is available for people to see. Um, and ultimately, they were unable to find a way to uh, to get me uh, to get me fired, even Comey, with all his power, he had just been coming in as director, and uh, I just and I was able to leave on good terms uh, from from the FBI at that time. And that's what occurred. So, what's next then? When we talk about these poly crises, we started the World Economic Forum, and Klaus Schwab says that we are announced that this latest you know la latest Davos. Thing in Switzerland that we are facing poly crises. 
and these unelected group of globalists that want us to have this, I don't know, next round of disasters, next round of crises that they can control yeah. and manipulate us. What is their goal? What do we expect to see? You've been, you've been right on many, many accounts on this. So what, what can we expect to see over the next coming months into 2023, into 2024, at the, at the end of this year, into 2024? Well, we can expect uh, for uh, this policy of polycrisis to keep going and keep expanding. Uh, polycrisis should be trending on Twitter. Uh, it should be everywhere. Uh, it is a term that means basically a large series of attacks in many different areas coming forward against the United States in many different areas. Cyber attack, climate crisis, pandemics, economic collapse all at the same time. Uh, it's basically just being attacked on multiple fronts with multiple mass casualty events. And with also the most important part, with no resistance or attempts by national local police or forces and authorities to try to protect the public or to investigate any of these attacks. That's a very important component. These things can't go forward if there's any investigation. So that's why we have been seeing all of these, we've been seeing all of these railroad attacks, all these railroad uh, derailings and the dumping of these toxic chemicals into our atmosphere. There's been no investigation. We haven't had a single FBI person step forward and have a press conference Hey, we're getting to the bottom of these uh, these railroad attacks and, and the uh, dumping. We're getting no, there hasn't no. been no, no. In fact, we heard from, from the head of the FBI last week, just a few days ago. Um, depending on when you're watching this video, we have the head of the FBI talking about China, the China problem, the concerns about <laughs> China. So nothing about American problems. We're all about China. Oh my gosh! And so now, so then we need to ask ourselves. Who came up with this uh, policy of polycrisis, of multiple attacks against Western nations on several different fronts? Who was it? It was Klaus Schwab. He wrote about this in his book many, time, many times. Uh, he also made uh, this the theme of the latest Davos annual conference. Uh, the actual, the actual uh, uh, title of the conference was 2023 is the year of polycrisis crisis. He said it. And sure enough, 2023 has been poly crisis right. and it's going to continue. It's going to continue to get worse. And the worst part about it is what I just said, that our, our authorities are not allowed to investigate any of these, of these poly crisis incidents that are occurring against the American people. That's how you know that all of our authorities have to be eradicated. They have to be eradicated because they're no longer, this is, this is treason, basically. It's treason for them not to do their job and instead yeah. to stand down during all of these attacks that are occurring against the American people, which Klaus Schwab uh, predicted. And as soon as he said it, uh, and at Davos, so as soon as he put forward that conference, they started happening and they're going to get worse. That's where we are right now. So I'll get you out of here on this, John, which is, you know, to anybody who's maybe like skeptical, I always come at everything with an open mind. I have my whole life and uh, I always, you know, I want to seek the truth the whole time until I'm, I'm proven, proven wrong about something. Show me the evidence of this. When, the F, when you left the FBI under these terms about, you know, James Comey and so forth, have they come to you? Have, the, have you caused problems for them? Have they said, John, you got to stop talking about this stuff? Have you had any interaction with them where they're, they're trying to silence you, keep you quiet? No, not at all. They, they don't, uh, they don't uh, care about the stuff that I put out uh, and about the material uh, simply because, and, and this is the real reason, is because, because the material that I put out always has the label on it of being paranormal, uh, supernatural in a sense. And uh, they, and so because that label is associated with it, um, like for instance, my book, The Extra Dimensionals, uh, because 
it they had to approve they had to approve that book they always have to approve any books that i write uh and they do simply because it all has that label on it of paranormal supernatural and they cannot really connect in their minds uh that this stuff is real they really don't uh so for that reason uh, they don't have any concern about the stuff that i talk about that's the mm -hmm. reason why so the book is called The Extra Dimensionals, The True Tales and Concepts of Alien Visitors. And you talk about um, all areas in which we've been deceived to believe in the physical world as being the end, end all and be all of things. And really the extra dimensionals, as you point out, is a stark revelation of where alien visitors are actually coming from and to where they're returning to. Um, so I would encourage everyone to check out the book with an open mind as we always try to do here on the show, and to check that out. Um, right now, as you mentioned, it's one of the top-rated uh, books on Amazon, um, right at the very top. So congrats on that. So, John, any uh, sort of final thoughts here for our audience as we head into summertime of 2023? I mean, I always try to warn our audience to be aware of being used by the deep state, how they're lying to you, the media manipulation you know, the when you see things all happening on CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times all on the same day, that to, to just to be open and aware of how you're being played, what would you say to our audience? Sort of final thoughts here. You've been you've been in the belly of the beast for many many years. What do you uh, what do you say to somebody who's a newcomer to this? All that we're trying to do at this point is save as many lives as we can. That's it. That's it. And if you can understand. Uh, if you can understand these realities that uh, alien visitors and true UFOs are not physical, that uh, the government is lying to you as soon as they say certain things, if they use, as soon as they use buzzwords like UAP or, um, or um, you know, these, uh, these uh, vaxes, these uh, needles are for your good, uh, they're, they're to make you a better person. Uh, and uh, or we're gonna, you know, we're gonna lock you down for your own good. Uh, you have to be able to articulate why you know these are lies, these are deceptions, and how we are going to save our own lives and save the lives of others by recognizing these deceptions, recognizing that these things are not true. That's why everything I put out is for people's self-defense, for their self-defense of their minds because that's the self-defense that's going to save their lives and the lives of others. That's what I want people to understand and people to know, basically. That's the most important thing, save people's lives. Hallelujah to that. Amen to that. Uh, my guest has been John D'Souza. It's been fascinating to hear your story and to hear the stories that you know as well, the cases you've recovered, um, and uh, to really alter maybe uh, give some shifts in my brain and my thinking about certain things as well to go deeper and to do some more research on certain topics uh, here to four. John D'Souza has been my guest, retired FBI special agent serving 25 years in counterterrorism and paranormal cases. John, thank you so much for joining us here on Redacted Conversations. Thank you, Clayton. Great stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you.